Okay, hello everyone and welcome to our December YouTube live Q&A with the Kidney Project. I'm Elizabeth Gress. I'm our Director of Partnerships, Communications and Regulatory Affairs at the Kidney Project. Um, and we are excited uh, to talk to you guys today about artificial kidneys, past, present and future. Um, and with us for this conversation, we have Dr. Uh, Foko Vairingha, uh, who is a principal scientist at IMEC in the Netherlands, where he works on wearable health solutions. He holds a PhD in biomedical photonics and is a part-time associate professor of medical technology at the University Medical Center Utrecht. Uh, Dr. Weiringa is a key member of the Dutch Kidney Foundation's Neo Kidney Initiative um, to develop a portable artificial kidney and is a liaison to the FDA and American Society of Nephrology's Kidney Health Initiative. Um, and he's also part of the European Kidney Health Alliance. So um, Dr. Weiringa, thank you so much for being here today. And um, he will be talking with the Kidney Project's technical director, Dr. Shivo Roy, uh, for this conversation. So um, let's get started. Thank you, Liz and Foco. Thank you for joining us. What a pleasure it is to have you join us on our YouTube uh, channel. And um, I have known you obviously for many years now through the American Society of Artificial Internal Organs. And for those of you in the audience who may know, not know of it, it's a very interesting history that Foco actually has, is gonna to explain to us a little bit in a bit. In a bit. But um, Foco and I um, have known each other for many years. He's a strong supporter of all things kidney for the patient group. And he has really inspired us on thinking about the end goal, which is not about just a cool technology, not about a discovery, but really impacting patient lives and has inspired our lab and the Kidney Project to really think about the, the urgency and the need to get to a solution sooner than later. So Foco, welcome. And uh, just maybe take us through about yourself a little bit and then tell us a little bit about, you know, the connections to kidney treatments in the Netherlands. Okay, well, very short. Uh, I'm now 57 years old, um, still alive and kicking, been in medical technology for uh, 35 years or so, and always being either repairing stuff or um, inventing new, new technologies. And it's really a, a pleasure to work for the kidney patients because they are a neglected group. Uh, it's a crying out loud shame <clears throat> that basically we use 50 year old technology to keep people alive, whereas we could have done better if more investment would have been done on it. So I'm very happy that you and Bill Fazell and your wonderful group are working on this topic. And I see this as very exciting that we have this talk today. Yeah, you know, we talk about, you know, the artificial kidney, which is a term terminology we use here, but it was really the first artificial kidney was invented in your country, the Netherlands. Can you share with our audience a little bit about the work there and how it has moved uh, forward over the decades? I can, I can, yeah. I've got some original uh, slides, well, photographs of those days. Let me try to start that. Let me see, I hope you can see this. So on April 4th, 1943, so next year, it's gonna be 80 years of hemodialysis. Dr. Willem Kolf in the Netherlands in the small city of Kampen connects Janni Schrijver first in line to a hemodialysis machine that he built himself. And uh, one of the funny things here is that the metal that you see comes from a shut down German plane. And he used as a dialyzer membrane, he used a sausage uh, skin coming from America, by the way, it was American cellophane sausage skin that he used. And the coupling that the, the blood went through was a rotating coupling and it came from a T Ford engine. So two American parts were already there in this first hemodialysis machine that worked. The bathtub was made by a local manufacturer illegally because the local manufacturer was only allowed to work for the Germans. So he didn't want to build, so, no, 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 no build, just keep it. Because uh, he was afraid that the Germans are, are otherwise would uh, execute him. And this was then the very primitive machine that woke Janis Schreiber on January, uh, April 4th, 1943 from uremic coma. 
after the war, just very short after the war, um, Kolf um, treated the first patient that really survived for years. Janis Schreiber died because her vascular access gave problems and she needed chronic dialysis, which Kolf couldn't give her. But in 1945, he wrote his thesis and he built four extra machines in the, in the just liber liberated Netherlands from his own costs. He didn't claim a patent. And he sent those four machines from the Netherlands to London, to Poland, to Canada, and to the US. So thankful for liberation of our country to the liberators that did that. Those from those countries, troops liberated our country. And that was the beginning of, um, well, the success of hemodialysis. But as I said, vascular access was the big Achilles heel still. The machine worked reasonably well, but the vascular access gave troubles. I hope that satisfies your curiosity. Yeah, that, that's that's fascinating to see, you know, the history here and the nature of Dr. Kolf to do this. Often we talk about medical technology today. It's all about, you know, how can we make money? What's the capitalistic route to making a product? And often, you know, the other goals come secondary to it. And it is heartwarming to see he did that. And I think what you didn't cover is actually Dr. Kolf ended up coming to the U.S., right? Yeah. And he ended up continuing to develop. Can you talk a little bit about his desire to move and what he did in the U.S. and how that led to the formation of ASAIO with the organization? Yeah, like I can. So, of course, uh, Netherlands was devastated after World War II. We, uh, a lot of stuff was shut in ruins and the country had to be rebuilt from the ground upon. So there were many things on the mind of the Dutch government and, and the least of things were um, um, the, the chronic dialysis, uh, chronic uh, kidney patients, keeping those alive was not so interesting for the government. Sounds crude, but those people died normally and well, um, there was no cure, so why bother? Uh, they couldn't understand that the machine could take over organ function. Nobody would really believe it, although he could prove it with uh, his experiments. And uh, after long deliberation, he talked with his wife, um, Janke, and she had a lot of money, by the way, that was good. And they decided to move to the US because one of the machines that was sent to the US did make uh, quite uh, uh, interest, did raise quite an interest in the US. And they said, you know what, come over to us. And in the US, the situation was completely different. There was a functional industry. There was a lot of investment capital present the U.S. had not been uh, bombed out of everything. Everything was working. All the industry was up and running. So there was much more uh, ways to raise capital and start production of things in the U.S. And so in 1950, he emigrated. And later on uh, he, in Utah, he was the leader of the team that implanted the first complete artificial heart. But he emigrated from... Uh, 1950 from the Netherlands to the US and had to start all at the bottom. Nevertheless, 1955, he was already elected as the first president of the American Society for Artificial Internal Organs. Can you imagine a foreigner, an immigrant in those days that was much harder than, than now and now it's still hard, uh, but he was within five years uh, elected as unanimously as the first president of an American Association for Artificial Internal Organs, which is still existing and thriving, by the way. And that's why we met. That is right, Foucault. And the other thing we have to say about Dr. Kolf, uh, because it's such a big inspiration to all of us, you just said it. He worked, obviously, on the kidney. He worked on the heart. He also worked on the lung, right? Yeah, he, worked, yeah, he, he was, he was he an did. innovator in multiple scales. He was in the elderly home, still working on artificial lungs, and half of the elderly home was working with him. That was, he motivated a lot of people. That was um, really remarkable. Um, that, that is really um, an example that the Dutch Kidney Foundation still is holding to us. And uh, the reason that he started working on artificial kidney in the first place was his very first patient as a doctor, was a young guy coming from a farm, a farmer's son, who had, uh, well, failing kidneys. And the professor said to him, you know, don't, don't play chess with the boy. Don't be friend with him because he'll die and it'll, it'll be hard on you. 
but he could not um, he could not let that go and said no I I, I want to know there must be a way that we can somehow replace that kidney function and that was his drive to to look for better ways and he found one which is uh, and and even during a war in which everything was difficult to obtain still he he carried on and he got the machine running and he did it hidden for the Nazis. Isn't that amazing? Um, so obviously he did this work, gosh, uh, almost 80 years ago. And we, you've had a chance to obviously um, look at his work and you've written articles about Dr. Kolf. There's a book that's an English translation that I have in my desk. You probably have it also. Oh, yeah. About Dr. Kolf. Um, how do you think dialysis today has shifted or changed from the time he started it? And what are some of the issues we're still dealing with? You alluded to one, which is vascular access. So take us through some of the changes that have happened since he treated those first patients. Well, vascular access, like I like said, is still um, a problem. Of course, um, it is not really natural to bring the blood out of the body through an ex uh, external circuit and bring it back again. Uh, you'd rather keep it in the body. Uh, that, that's what our body tries to do all the time. Um, so that hasn't changed yet. Yet. I think you're working on that, Juho. Uh, and um, another thing is the membrane. Uh, so he used a, a membrane to exchange between the blood and between a bath, really it was a bath in which the rotating cylinder was going around. Um, and, and this exchange between the blood side and the, and the dilysate side of a membrane has not changed. It is ex exactly the same still. We have better membranes and new polymer types and, and, and a lot of things have, uh, have Im improved. That's totally true. But the basic principle of a, having a membrane and having a, a size of particles based exchanged has not really changed, um, which is a pity because um, Kolf didn't want to stop at machines at the bedside. He wanted to make a wearable. And he, he in fact, he did, but there's not more than 20 of them were, were built because the industry didn't see uh, the commercial use of it. It, it functioned. But it, the question was not, uh, doesn't it function? The, the question was, can we make money with it? So there you touched up already upon one of the fundamental problems. Yeah, you know, you've basically made the point that we have changed, but not maybe so fundamentally, not so much. But one of the things we recently met at Kidney Week, the American Society of Nephrology's annual meeting, and I was able to see some of the work you're involved in um, specifically the next generation and how changes are happening uh, with this particular effort, Next Kidney. Could you tell us a little more about what that is and how that is different and what are the advantages over the conventional ways of doing you know, renal replacement? And be, and be okay, uh, I, I made some slides on that because I think I saw that coming when you were visiting me. Uh, so if we... Um, look upon uh, the next kidney. This is how it looks, by the way. And here's my wonderful colleague, uh, Professor uh, Karin Gerritsen from the University Medical Center of Utrecht that I have the honor to work with when I'm there part-time. I also work as an associate professor there and we share the same room. And that's also wonderful because she is a nephrologist, can inspire me as a technologist, but this is a machine. And if we collapse it, if we all everything folding it together, it fits in that carry on trolley that can go with you in the air cabin as carry on luggage. So if you look upon how do we do uh, kidney replacement therapy nowadays, well, transplantation, of course, is the very best thing you can get at the moment, but you need to swallow immune, immune suppression for that. And the COVID pandemic has unfortunately learned us extra that that is not a big advantage. And that is, that is a disadvantage. Uh, but of course, the good side is you don't need a machine and you don't need dialysate. You're you're off the hook, you can move around and almost live a normal life. That's super. Unfortunately, there's much too little donor organs and not everybody even can be transplanted. So hemodialysis is a mainstay therapy that many of the people have to use. There's of course also peritoneal dialysis, which uses your peritoneum, which is a natural membrane in your belly. And then you only need to pump in the fluid and pump it out. 
But these two dialysis types have one thing in common as they are now. They are single pass technologies. So they use the dialysate once and then they throw it away. And that is, um, yeah, that has not improved over all those years. Single machine pass did, um, single pass machines did get some smaller and simpler. And, and uh, the annex stage is the most known. The quanta is new and also very neatly with the flap up. The Physidia machine we know now, the Tableau machine, of course, is also doing good work. They're all single pass machines, which means they use the dialysate once and then they have to throw it away. And that means you need a drain and you need a connection to get all that fluid in and you heat all that fluid with a lot of electricity. Um, and that makes you more or less stuck to the wall, although it is more or less portable in some cases, but still it's big and it's uh, energy and fluid guzzling. And that is a limit for miniaturization. And we all want to have it in our hand luggage. So this is what we did. We took miniaturization by regeneration. We are not using all that dialysate. We just use a limited volume. Four and a half liters is needed for um, every other day treatment. And there we have then um, only four and a half liters. And we re recirculate it and remove the toxins from it. That makes that we have to heat much less water. That makes our electricity consumption much lower, the water consumption, of course, much lower. And it also makes the pumps much easier. And that makes the machine uh, much smaller. The same approach, and this has been done by Next Kidney, the same approach can also be used for peritoneal dialysis, which has been done by AWEC. And they share a lot of the technology that they have um, is, is coming from the same origin in Singapore. Um, this is a two initiatives that are at the moment ongoing. So, so Foucault, uh, a quick question uh, before we go to the principle here. Is this um, the idea of water, you know, 120 liters per session for people in the U.S., that's about 30 gallons, 32 gallons, actually. Mm -hmm. um, how is that water prepared and what is the resource? Because I, in California, where I live, you know, water is a big challenge. Maybe in some parts of the country it's not, but has that ever been a consideration in different parts of the world and in the Netherlands? The well, in, <laughs> until a few years ago in the Netherlands, every, no, nobody cared too much about water consumption because we are below sea level and we have a lot of water coming from the river delta. But guess uh, last year we had an official drought, an official drought. We had uh, don't sprinkle your garden, uh, be careful, um, use the small button, for flushing the toilet if it's needed. Uh, uh, save water, save water. Like, you know it from California, of course, many years. We had an official drought in the Netherlands for all sake. That was incredible, but it is true. And we expect that we're going to see more of that coming. So uh, if we then look upon countries like Australia, where um, the water problem really is huge, uh, and, and we hear from nephrologists in Australia that say we have Aboriginal patients that are flown out of the outback three times a week in a Cessna to go to a clinic to be treated and then they're flown back. Yeah, that is, of course, that is, of course, if you look upon, if you just fly in once every month and you bring the supplies for a whole month, you'd be easy, you'd be cheaper off and people could go on their lives in their own place. So, and Japan, for instance, has also um, shown, of course, the tsunami they had, where the infrastructure was ruined and there was no power, there was no water. It was simply gone. The whole infrastructure was flushed away or with the earthquake gone away. And in those situations, you'd like to have a very small uh, solution that you can bring very easily to places with simple power requirements and uh, small uh, amounts of disposables so that one pellet can keep you a month going instead of one pellet can keep you a day going. Yeah, the other thing you also, you probably can talk to this as well, to just create one liter of water for dialysis solution, you need a lot, many liters. Yeah, yeah. Three, to three to five. Depends yeah. on the, the generation of your water purification system, but it, it can be as bad as five liters of good pot potable water going into one liter of dialysate quality water. If you have a more modern system, it's about three liters. But still, that's a, a huge amount of good drinking water that never even sees the patient. 
That's right. And you think about the, you, you know, we're not even touching the carbon footprint for flying this around or taking the patient. We're talking about, you know, all the excess yeah. uh, uh, infrastructure that has to go into it. And yeah. it ties in very well, I think, the approach you guys are talking about at Next Kidney with some of the sustainability goal of the United Nations, because water is a scarce resource and becoming more so. It is. And electricity is the same thing. And uh, we see now in Ukraine, um, and, you know, we, we, Mr. Putin killed many, many dialysis patients by cutting the water and the electricity. That means these people are dead within two days uh, uh, because they can't be treated anymore. Uh, how, can, how can they? So well, thank, you. thank you for the diversion, because I wanted to make sure that we understand as the audience here, you know, that, you know, it's not just making water, the water, the ability requires effort and the cost that is associated and just how much we waste. But anyway, let me get you, let you get back to explaining to us. This is fascinating. We've got two ways, portable hemo and portable peritoneal. And now you're going to tell us how you're. Okay, well, uh, I can only speak, of course, for Next Kidney. I'm not a part of AWEC, but basically their sorbent is more or less the same. Uh, you have a sorbent solution, um, a sorbent cartridge here, which is cleaning the spent dialysate. And when it comes out, it's purified, but also the calcium, the magnesium, and the uh, potassium are unfortunately taken out. So those you have to replenish from this blue bag in a proportional uh, way to pump. And then you have a weighing bag, which is also the heater chamber. And it's, it's a weight scale that heats the stuff and then it goes back into the filter. So with the weight scale, we can also measure how quickly and how much fluid we have withdrawn from the patient. Because you, of course, want to know how much fluid did we take out. But the blood circuit is not different than conventional hemodialysis. It's simply a blood pump and a blood circuit, as we all know. It's the innovation that's on the dialysate side, and that makes it uh, portable. Um, and one thing that is also very interesting is because we only need uh, small heater elements, we don't have a high leakage current, and that means that we are cardiac floating and don't need grounding for safety. We're completely uh, in, not depending on grounding. It doesn't matter if you have a grounded plug or an ungrounded plug, it'll always work. The only thing is, of course, the form of the plug is different in the US and Japan than it is in the European Union. But for the rest, two-prong plug and go anywhere, go camping, go whatever, wherever you have a generator that is reliable and the hygiene is okay, you can dialysate. And um, the National University of Hospital of Singapore, we have Dr. Titus Lau and Dr. Wong Peijing, who have um, been working on testing the sorbent safety already. That has been done already and that was okay. Now you see a normal hemodialysis machine here. The reason is we split the problem in two. We wanted to know the safety of the sorbent and we fed a normal hemodialysis machine with a sorbent dialysate circuit. So the machine didn't know it was getting reused, reconfigured dialysate, but it checks the safety of the dialysate and says, it's okay. It's as good as new because the machine can't see the difference. And that worked wonderful. Now, the next step that we are preparing at this very moment is the University Hospital in Cannes in France, um, where, where D-Day was, uh, as many Americans will know, uh, will be tested by Dr. Massance Fichieux. So our D-Day will also begin in, in France in the same region. And then we will expand to the University Medical Center in Utrecht in the Netherlands with my charming colleague, Dr. Karin Gerritsen, who will um, treat the patients there. And um, this is how the machine looks like again. And just because it's important, I think, to realize there's a blood side with the dialyzer filter and there's the cassette which goes in for the pumps. We also have a cassette for the pumps on the, on the dialysate side. And we, we basically could cut the machine in two parts, the blood part and the dialysate part. And you see the sorbent cartridge standing over there. It fits in a carry-on uh, trolley. It's the biggest carry-on trolley that is allowed by the IATA agreement. So um, uh, it, it, it is indeed, but it fits. And um, that is already a comfort for many people because they say that my nightmare would be that I would be in Tokyo and my machine would be in Toronto. And uh, there's even people that can tell us stories of that it actually happened to them. So that's why they are in 
always insisting and it should be hand luggage. I, I want to know it's in my overhead bin. I want to know that I, that I have it with me. Yeah, so you have, so this is very uh, interesting. It's fascinating that you've got uh, something that's very close. So can you tell us, we saw the word CE mark, what that means and then what the next steps are to sort of have it in other parts of the world. And obviously a lot of our audience is here in the United States. So how about bring it to the United States? Well, the CE mark is more or less the equivalent of FDA approval in the US. Uh, the procedures are slightly different, but I must say the, the two continents are more and more trying to unify the regulations so that if, if it's accepted for CE marking in Europe, uh, usually it also in the end will be accepted uh, once the proper tests have done. We are thinking about, but that's uh, also will depend on the amount of money that we can raise here in Europe to also in parallel to the CE marking, start talking with the FDA for FDA approval as soon as we can do it. That's unusual. Usually you start with first in either the US or the Europe and trying to make money, but we think it's morally obliged that we uh, try also to reach the US as soon as possible. It would be unfair not to try to do that uh, as soon as we can do it. And I must say the FDA is extremely innovation minded. Those people are really, really uh, doing a lot for the whole kidney community as well, you know, Shuvo, and they're reaching out and um, they're really encouraging um, to, yeah, to improve innovations. They really give good tips. So we're, we just started also talking to the FDA but of course, we have to do all the proper paperwork and all. There's no shortcutting anywhere. You have to do all the fulfill all the requirements for safety. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I, I, we both have talked to them independently and together, but they're help, willing to help and streamline some of the processes, but they will not compromise safety as it should be. They shouldn't compromise. It should be. Exactly. We agree with that. So I'm really encouraged to hear that you're starting the process. I know many of our audience have always asked, you know, what, you know, we, we have the end goal in our, the kidney project of an implantable artificial kidney. What is the steps to get there? And maybe one of the steps is actually improving in a very dramatic way, the technologies that allow us to transport hemodialysis. And, and you've made a point, it can be on carry-on luggage uh, and it can go across the world uh, just with that little, you know, dialysis sorbent cartridge, which is really, really exciting. Can you talk a little bit about um, the, the, the weight of that? Because people care about how much you like. Can they carry it in their hand? Or do they roll it off? Yeah, well, it's, it's just doable, but I must say that uh, it's about 12 kilograms at the moment if you have the suitcase with, with the machine. And um, that is for, for many hemodialysis patients still quite heavy, but it has wheels. So it, it's, it's not just a suitcase, it's a trolley. So uh, you can carry it you can pull it behind you that's already helping but of course somebody you have to lift it in, into the overhead bin but they're usually well, yeah, 25, yeah, 25 pounds yeah i mean that's uh, many of us travel with carry-on and actually this i have i have helped people with the suitcases in carry-on are more than 25 pounds they're like 40 yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well officially they shouldn't be but uh, indeed the plane yeah. can handle it no doubt but yeah. uh yeah no this is fascinating and um I was going to ask you, because you have been thinking about this is the present and we're really moving to also looking to the future. And as you know, um, uh, I was lucky enough to meet your queen, Queen Maxima of the Netherlands when she visited San Francisco and specifically our uh, organization, UCSF, a few months back. And she actually came and talked about the work we're doing and the artificial kidney. And I was really fascinated because when I did mention, you know, that the, the work in the Netherlands, she was very, obviously, very much aware. So can you tell us a little bit of how the government and their Dutch royal family is supporting innovation, especially in this area, and overall, also what else is happening in Europe? Oh, yeah, I, I'm very happy to say that uh, our Dutch royal, royal family is extremely, um, you know, driven to help um, health Health matters are, are really um, uh, mattering a lot to them. And the kidney has a very warm place with them. So our king as well, he couldn't come when, uh, when he, they were visiting San Francisco because he was ill, but um, otherwise he would have loved to come. But our king also, um, you know, regularly speaks with the, the, the 
director of the Dutch Kidney Foundation, and then he asked, "How's with the how's with the uh, portable artificial kidney? How's it going along?" And now he has more questions to ask. How is the kidney project in California going on? And um, I, in fact, um, we also have a lot of goodwill from our government, and they have invested just this uh, year. At the end of this year, it has been uh, decided that they're going to invest 37 million euros from the Dutch no uh, National uh, Growth Fund into artificial kidney technology. So 37 million euros. Nowadays, dollar and euros are about the same, uh, I heard. So that's quite a substantial uh, investment. And the European Union also is uh, in the KidNew project, uh, investing then 3.7 million. It should be the other way around, you think, eh? that that the EU would put in more money than a small country, but our country is at the moment the front runner, I think. Yeah, tell us a little bit about the Kid New project, and then also, obviously, you know, all the excitement you guys have done with the Next Kidney. I can see one of the projects we have here is called iHemo, which is actually taking the filter component of our artificial kidney and proposing it as a technology for home hemodialysis. I know you you have when you saw it. Uh, you just immediately came to your mind how the two might be married. So share with us how oh, you yeah. see this working and how the two fit each other, because I do hope that given the enthusiasm and the improvements you've made uh, on both sides of the uh, sorbent as well as the machine pump side, uh, we, there may be an opportunity to collaborate. So I know you've thought you shared with me. So it'd be great to hear from you and the, and with the audience what that idea is. Okay, well, uh, I'm sharing my screen again then. Um... Well, it was not just our queen that visited you, but also our um, minister of health and our um, minister of um, education. So those three people came back very enthusiastic and said, whoa, something is really going on there in San Francisco. And I, we said, yeah, we knew that. And we told you that it was worth going there. Um, so if we look upon the machine, I, I just told you, huh? uh, it is the left part is the blood part. The right part is the dialysate part with the cartridge that you're holding here. And while we were talking in ASN Kidney Week, and I'm very happy that Steve Ash had is just between the two of us, because with the three of us, we were discussing, wait a minute, why don't we put our small um, dialysate regeneration circuit to your IHEMO? And I believe that this was one of the slides that you showed to our queen and her uh, two ministers about the plans for the implantable hemofilter, which would be then in the body and the blood would go through all the time. And so no needling anymore. You, you just have, don't have to needle because you're connected all the time and the filter is in there. The blood stays in the body. You only would have dialysate out and dialysate in a connection. So functionally, it would look like a PD, peritoneal dialysis connection. Normally, when you wouldn't use the device, you'd shortcut those two lines. And then after the pressure has been equilibrated, there's no flow anymore and you can go wherever you want. And if you want to use it, you just remove the short circuit and connect it to the small machine. And remember, you only need half of the suitcase machine that we now have. So half of the machine that already fits into a carry-on luggage. Now we need only half of it because the blood side we don't need anymore. You already implant that. So that would be a very small shoebox size machine. As I remember that you once said during a kidney X pitch that you want to have a shoebox size machine. Well, this is it with the, uh, with the cartridge and that stuff. And the beauty would be that this disposable pump cartridge and these um, sorbent cartridges would already be made on a uh, production line. So that means no investment needed to make those two new or maybe adapt them a little bit. But in, in principle, they would also be 510K certifiable for your use with your system. It would be hemodialysis, but with the filter in the patient. Yeah, all... you know, I was going to say that one of the things that I think struck me and it was very apt to what you wrote in one of your slides is trying to address this challenge of vascular access, right? Yeah. So there's no need for needles. No blood is coming outside the body. Exactly. All the complications. All you have coming outside the body is a catheter that catheters that go to the other solution. So if there's a disconnect, no fear of loss of blood. 
you have to do in connection is just a catheter lure like connection, not a needle. And the machine is half the size. So presumably now it's even more portable. Maybe one hand you can put up in your, in the oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. It, it'll be uh, much less uh, heavy. And uh, so it also would, if I was already thinking, you know, um, we could have some battery in there and uh, well, there's lots of ways that you can uh, exploit it, but indeed, basically half the machine is only needed and you'd be much more free to travel and go anywhere. But of course, I know that in the end, you'd like to have the fully implantable artificial kidney connected to the bladder. And that definitely I support. The, this would just be a way to quicker go with a product to patients that would change their life already. Yes, and, and you're right. And there's lots of uh, already clinical data that says if you can do that. We, if we, uh, well, you, you send in, uh, I have to highlight that. Uh, people from KidneyX, if you're listening, give them the money. Um, you, you send in a wonderful kidney project uh, proposal to KidneyX. Yeah. which uh, the Dutch have sent a letter of support saying that if you uh, get that kidney X prize, we will help you with connecting our sorbent-based machine as the dialysate circuit so that you ver could very quickly go to um, trials. And because, you know, we are already CE marking in that trajectory with the disposables. So you could focus on the hemofilter there and we could be very quickly having something which would meet all the, the EU and the US safety certification regulations because um, it would be simple because you would be leaning upon a product which already uh, will be certified in 2024 as far as we know. Now, you know, the other thing that you mentioned, which is very important, you talk about uh, Kidney X, uh, which has provided some of the funding but brought the community together as well, is doing the testing of the filter for the iHemo concept is also the step, a critical step based on our discussions with the FDA about moving forward in the implantable bio-artificial kidney. Yeah, exactly. You can show the safety and the operation of the membrane technology. So not only does it help iHemo, it also helps the complete total yeah. implantable artificial kidney. On that note, um, there's obviously work happening in the Netherlands and Europe. So what can you, can you give us a landscape of what's happening in terms of bio-artificial or totally uh, total artificial kidneys in Europe and some of the efforts that are under that are taking place now? Yeah, uh, of course, uh, um, Uter, I, I might stop sharing. Oh, wait, wait a minute. I think, oh, I can quickly uh, go further ahead. So we, we've seen this and this is what I just wanted to say. Huh? So this sorbent technology for regeneration can also be combined with your IHEMO. Um, but if we think about um, bioartificial kidneys, then in Utrecht uh, Hospital, can't help it, as you know, um, a lot of work is also being done. And the KidNew project that the European Union just has um, honorated with a grant of 3.7 million euros uh, is also looking on um, replacing uh, not just the glomerulus, but also the tubulus. So not only doing the sieving at size, but also having the, the bioreactor. And we're also working on a bioreactor. And I would love to see that we somehow can start exchanging, for instance, students or finding ways and common ground to, to work together. Because I believe that the best brains are not, they cannot be just in one country. They're scattered around the world. And the groups that have pieces of the puzzle are scattered around the world. And we should, well, we should work together on that. I, I do believe that I could even share something about that. So um, we, we, for instance, are now also working in Europe with Kidney on silicon nano sieve filters, a different principle as, as your approach. But I believe that probably the, the best solution will be a mix of those most likely. And we are also working um, to make this modular so that we can um, combine with work of others. Uh, we also have this, the MyTram chip, for instance, from iMac that um, can be combined to shake loose the protein bound uremic toxins on such a filter and monitor um, all kinds of medical parameters uh, in the patient 
and talk to a wearable for periodic charge and for the communication so that telehealth really gets a new dimension. I, I believe that with the proper funding, this can be done in 2030, especially if we can work together. So basically, uh, the American Association for Kidney Patients already called out the decade of the kidney, which basically is bundling the best brains to build better treatments by having the patients, the doctors, the nurses, the policymakers, inventors, and investors, very important, with good engineers and entrepreneurs that see business opportunities to, to step into the decade of the kidney across the world. AAKP is in there. The European Kidney Patient Federation is in there and the European Kidney Health Alliance is in there. And um, this was a cartoon coming from Europe. I think when we learned to know each other, this was <laughs> one of the things I showed. Um, we need a worldwide solid funding program. And the good news is that this not only works with euros, it works with all kinds of currencies. And, uh, and if we combine people uh, from groups like you have in in San Francisco, in Vanderbilt, uh, Seattle, of course, with the Center for Dialysis Innovation, UMC Utrecht, and many other places in the world, if we can combine the puzzle pieces, that would be awesome, and we would get there. You're absolutely right, and I think this attention uh, that's being generated for uh, working together uh, through some of the efforts on the international consortia, but also the domestic efforts by the AAKP, which is a partner actually of the Kidney Project. Uh, we're really excited to um, move forward and we're looking forward to exciting 2023. Let's use this opportunity now. I know questions have been coming in. Um, Liz uh, has been uh, getting these questions. Maybe Liz, we should take some questions and figure out, you know, we don't have much time, but would love to always answer questions as they come in from the audience. Yes, uh, that sounds great. Um, so the first question actually was submitted um, in the pre-registration, um, and it's one for uh, Foco. Um, what do you think will be the next improvements to dialysis technology that patients that will actually come to patients? Um, well, um, the suitcase hemodialysis machine will come to patients. Uh, we have the funding to do so. It's just now filling the paperwork, but in 2024, it should be on the market. And we, we hope in parallel to also have it then to American patients or just a few months later. Um, we're, we're doing all the best we can to also in parallel as soon as possible have it in the US. Wearable PD most likely will also come. I have no influence upon it, but I see AWAC still in clinical trials, so looks okay. Then the iHemo, I think, is, is the, the next step that we want to see. And it's, it's more or less a matter of how eager are we to have it? If the governments really want it, then they hopefully should provide the, the, the funding to do so. I'm convinced that if Europe and the US work together on this, that end of 2024, the first demonstration would be a realistic, but it, it's all depending on the funding. The technology is already there. If it would have been the next PlayStation, we'd already have it. So actually, Foco, I want to, you know, you, my, my audience here, uh, they know a lot about our challenges for funding for the Kidney Project. And how, can you give an example, maybe from your perspective, of how you guys were able to address the funding for Next Kidney? I know there's some innovative mechanisms at the foundation, the Dutch Kidney Foundation that took. And maybe the lessons some of our audience members can take with the local groups here as well. Well, indeed, um, the Dutch Kidney Foundation uh, provided the seed capital for Next Kidney. They were sick and tired of the lack of innovation, and they see them. They said the market is not doing its work, so let's then step into the market and do this. They they made a small company, and they made clever contracts. So uh, if there's any profit coming into the Neo Kidney company that they uh, they founded, that profit is mandatory going into new research for an even better product. Like for instance, <laughs> could be Ahimo. Um, so that is a, a clever way to go. But most remarkably, and I've, I've been 35 years in medical technology, but I've never seen anything like this before. The three biggest healthcare insurance companies from the Netherlands, they uh, normally are competitors, of course, but they jointly have invested uh, 8 million euros also in the, the whole Next Kidney project 
because they are convinced that it will bring their patients better value, but also them, it will save money. So that's a, a win-win situation. And I've never heard about uh, insurance, health insurance company investing before the device was even there. They believe in the vision and they are supporting us heavily. Also with the thinking about, okay, so we have the device, it's CE Mart. How do we roll it out? How do we uh, educate people? How do we uh, make it run in the structures? How do we think about reimbursement codes? They're already helping us out on that. Isn't that wonderful? And, and they're fully willing, I talked to them, they're fully willing to also talk to American healthcare insurance companies and explain why they think it's a good idea to invest in such uh, solutions that help patients better and also save costs for society. The money would be the same, the math would be the same on both sides of the ocean, you'd think. It's fascinating. No, I think the fact that a you know, Dutch Kidney Foundation stepped up. Um, maybe it's beginning to have some effect because at um, uh, Kidney Week, we got to learn from our friends at the National Kidney Foundation of initiative to create an innovation fund. They're still at the very early stages, but they, I think that idea is very powerful and you've actually shown it can move and not have to wait for the okay. car conventional investors, uh, because these are people who are motivated, not just by the return, but also by a patient group. And hopefully our audience here, you know, many of you are members of NKF and other groups, you can encourage them that these are the kinds of things that are desperately needed because the traditional method has not served us well in moving forward. So we're already talking from the European Kidney Health Alliance and the AAKP with um, the MIT, which of course is the Mecca of technology in America, um, there's Andrew Lowe, who is a financial engineering specialist, and um, he has some wonderful ideas of, of setting up a consortium internationally that might tackle the problem. And uh, I'm sure that IHEMO and, of course, the bioartificial kidney after that would be um, pieces of the puzzle that would fit. But it's like you said. We, ha we have to do this stepwise and we have to make modules that by themselves are a uh, minimum viable product that can really go to the market, that can earn money to spend on the new one. Um, you have this wonderful example in the US of the Transcontinental um, Railroad. It was not built by, by somebody who said, let's put a lot of money and then we start earning as soon as as this moment that we touch each other, then we start earning money. No, they were already earning money by the lines, the pieces of line that they already had built. And before a guy on the moon ever set foot, there were already satellites uh, in space that were being commercially interesting for phone and uh, broadcasting. So that is the way that we should do it. We can learn from NASA, we can learn from, from each other and I would be happy to help. I'm talking too much. <laughs> no, Love that would it. be fantastic. Um, I think we'll go to a more sciencey question, um, and this one will be for uh, Shuvo. Um, what is the current thinking on supporting nephron growth um, slash health uh, to reverse CKD? Does advanced cellular understanding help here? So I think the audience is really asking about, you know, can we reverse uh, kidney disease before you get to kidney failure or even up from kidney failure? Uh, but the answer is, does more understanding help? Obviously, there's always understanding helps. And we want more uh, money to go to kidney research. In this country, uh, as is well known, the NIH is the primary funder of research. And for every kidney disease patient, they spend about $20. Whereas for, you know, cancer, it's close to $1,000. Despite the fact that most dialysis patients don't survive as long as most cancer patients. So clearly we need, we need uh, investment in research and, that should, and we should definitely focus on that. The, in terms of, uh, you know, does that work? There there's a company out there that's looking at this closely and I think they have clinical trials. Um, and, you know, I think once the results come out and are peer reviewed, we should have a better understanding. But we do know that if you can decrease the rate of progression of kidney disease, that's good. You can control your diabetes, that's good. Control your blood uh, pressure, that's good. So there are things anybody with kidney disease today can do that can minimize the likelihood of getting on to kidney failure. We, but we should have to also be looking for technologies like what FOCO and I have talked about to deal with 
the people who are in kidney failure. And certainly if there are ways to look at cell regeneration therapy, we should. But for the moment, most of those technologies, I don't think I'm being um, too pessimistic, is that they're still far away. They're still at the petri dish stage. Most of, the, most of them are. So the idea of we can grow kidney organoids, but do they actually work? There's a question mark. Can we then connect them to the vasculature? In principle, yes, but that's a question mark. Whereas the, you know, the portable, wearable technologies for dialysis are much more mature. And they've been at it more time, but then it is also possible that somebody is going to come up with a breakthrough discovery that negates all that. And that's fine too. But yeah. until that happens, the t focus team, my team, we want to be able to provide a solution. Great. Thanks for explaining that. Um, and then there's a lot of questions about um, the timing that uh, I, the implantable bio or artificial kidney might be ready for patients. And um, just wondering if you can speak a little bit to um, how much time and money is needed um, in order for, for patients to maybe be looking at getting an implantable artificial kidney. Always a popular question. And I'll give you, an, you know, an answer that is uh, correct, but also has a number of conditions attached to it. So let me start by saying, what is the technical work plan to show feasibility in a clinical study? That, along with my colleague, Dr. William Fizel at Vanderbilt, we have a pretty good understanding of what the technologies have to achieve. Now, with any technology development, you may have to iterate, solve problems, but if you are to do all that work and you know, we, we budget in some time, we can see that the technical work to get to the first human study is within the end of four years or so. Now there's a if, there's lots of ifs, no unanticipated challenges, uh, there's no big you know, issue that we had not thought about, we don't think so, but who knows. But that's there's an if that is also the funding that has to come in, and I've mentioned this before. So often our projects don't get funded through that goal, they get funded, hey, do this task, often for different um, uh, element, and we keep on pushing the project. If we had the resources we need and not have to worry about you know, raising money uh, periodically uh, or almost all the time like we do now, we could say within four years, that would be about $10 million to finish up the technology development work. It's not a product. I want to be clear. It's not a product. There's still work to be done, uh, additional studies with the FDA. That is less sort of within our wheelhouse, we'll have to find corporate partners, you have to find business people, industry, those can, those can run tens of millions, if not hundred million dollars or more. And, but again, our friends at the AAKP have declared this to be the decade of the kidney. And we know if the resources are available, you can get through the first clinical study within four years. And yep. I'll just sort of wrap up this point, the whole uh, part with one anecdote. Many of you know that we showed that we could produce urine by combining a small scale filter with a small scale cell therapy unit and we put it into a pig and it produced urine. Very little urine, but it did produce urine. And it worked with that immune suppression drugs and no systemic anticoagulation. We actually had a roadmap about how we developed the artificial kidney almost 15 years ago. And when we look at the roadmap, we achieved this goal, which we achieved just during the pandemic, was supposed to be been achieved in 2014. And the reason I did not achieve it earlier was just a lack of money. So I'll end there. Money is a big part, but we are committed. And hopefully with collaborations with uh, FOCO and his team and other groups, we'll be able to move forward. Yeah. Well, I can tell indeed, and I totally agree with what you just said. Huh? It's anyhow cheaper than buying Twitter. So that's that's already the encouraging news. A lot cheaper, a lot <laughs> not even 10%, more like 1% or less. Yeah. Crazy. Um, the next question is for FOCO. Um, and Shifo just mentioned the goal of, um, or this decade being the decade of the kidney um, and the goal of uh, getting an artificial kidney to patients by 2030. Um, what do you think needs to happen um, policy-wise for, for that to be possible? We're already working on that. So also, again, together with the wonderful AAKP, uh, on January 12th this year, we had a wonderful um, telco between the European Parliament members for kidney health 
and the U.S. Congressional Kidney Caucus. So there's policymakers in the, in the European Parliament and there's policymakers in the U.S. Congress that both are have a warm heart for kidney health. But the interesting thing was they didn't know each other. But now they do. And they are talking more often. And so we want to we want to have this bridge built between the policymakers to realize, hey, we're, we're looking to solve the same problem. Hey, the biology is the same on both sides of the ocean. Um, the currency is different, but that can be that can be adjusted. Well, wait a minute, we share the same problem. Now we just build a joint strike fighter. That's a machine that, that can kill people. We trust each other enough to build a high-tech machine that can kill people, and it works. Huh? We, we, we did it. It works. Now, we should trust each other definitely enough to build uh, stuff that can save people. So that is, the I think, this, the atmosphere that we're talking about now. These policymakers are really um, seeing the advantage of combining the best brains and having people work together, which would be wonderful because the funding systems are different. But if we find some, some translation methods of acknowledging, hey, wait a minute, we are investing on, say, in the Netherlands, and these 37 million, um, that's great. But there's a piece of the puzzle that is in San Francisco and, and a piece of the puzzle in Seattle, and we want to use that. You know what? Uh, we give you some extra points if you if you can get there and vice versa that governments say wait a minute if you can work together we'll we'll fund together and we'll make we'll share the results that would be great if we can do it with a fighter plane and we have done it and we have done it with an international space space station well then we certainly should be able to do this with artificial kidneys and we need several trails we need the purely biological approach yeah, with the xenotransplants and, and uh, modified pigs and oh, that's wonderful keep it on we need the bio artificial kidney keep it on the hybrid between techno and bio the purely technical solutions keep it on because modules of those different approaches will help each other as, soon, as long as we keep each other updated via the roadmap that Kidney Health, Health Initiative started, then we will have a very good chance to solve this much quicker than any country by itself ever could do. And Kidney Health Initiative also saw, um, they, they founded this solver community. Well, Chuvo and, and, and I are both in that solver community. There's many other Kidney X prize winners in that. And that solver communities should communicate more and find ways to find better funding and share the results. Kolf found out that he could dialysate uh, people and he shared the result with the societies. He sent out four machines across the world. He shared his knowledge for free. Well, those days may be gone, but let's at least find a, a way to have some co-opetition in which we are it's a mixture of co uh, competition and cooperation. We can do that. I'm sure we can. Sorry that I talk too much. No, that's great. It's great to hear the uh, optimism and that that these conversations and collaborations are already started. So that's that's really good to hear. Um, next question is for Shubo. And um, do you know if there are any companies looking into producing artificial kidneys um, or, or our artificial kidney once uh, clinical trials happen? Who are the kind of corporate partners that might be interested? So you're probably referring to, let's just be clear, you know, because there's a company, uh, Focus Company Next Kidney, of, I should say, the company Focus of Philips Next Kidney, that's an artificial kidney. But I think the, uh, the question may be our artificial kidney. Yeah. You yeah. know, we ref if you think about what we're doing, we have a silicon technology, a cell, is there one company that brings the both of them together that's already out there? The short answer is no. It may be that we have to have an existing large company commit their resources to bringing this to the market. And would be and there's many. They could be medical device companies. They could be biotech companies. Or it could be a company that is doing high technology. We want, in fact, we all know these companies and they want to do something in medicine. Okay. So we, there's no company that's saying our goal is to make a bio-artificial kidney as a stated mission today out there that's already established. 
So what we do know, and I've mentioned this to our audience before, is when you've gone and talked to many of the people that are very much interested in creating businesses or companies that want to create a new division, they've told us, yes, we would be interested in exploring this, but you need to de-risk this more. You need to take this to the next step. And you need to take ways of, and after much discussion, what we have identified is that key step is the first human studies. And that's going to require contributions like gifts, grants, prizes to get there. And we've gone, I'm in Silicon Valley, talked to a lot of people who are investors. They will be very, they understand the need. They understand the patient impact, where they have a challenge is, you know, the exit route. And it only becomes more meaningful if you can get it to that first human study. So our approach to the kidney project is to find ways to move from where we are today to that first in human study. And then we'll, I'm confident, you know, there'll be enough momentum that'll be able to bring in industry and investors. The experience that you would, if you have the iHemo, so the filter implanted, and that shows that works well, that of course is half of the bio artificial kidney already. And so that risk is diminished by step by step. And in that sense, we have to find this stepwise crossing the river by stepping stones. And I do think that um, international cooperation is, is the key to that. I really believe in that. I agree. Yes. Um, well, we're just about at the hour, but we'll end with one more question. Um, there was a question in the chat um, specifically about the potential IHEMO next kidney collaboration um, and what the timeline on, um, on that might, might potentially be in terms of getting a product to patients. Let me start by saying, and then Foco can talk a little more about the mechanics. So we had a nice conversation at the American Kidney Week, uh, American Society for Nephrologists Kidney Week, uh, as you can see in the, the picture that Foco showed. I got a chance to see it. I'm very excited. Um, obviously, they are uh, they have to do some work to move um, their product forward in Europe as well, well as the US. And they've assured me that you know they're interested in working together. Of course, we still have to raise money, et cetera, but I know there's desire. And that's often more than 50% of the battle. So now we're gonna make it happen and that may require our community here supporting us both with moral, with financial, but I know there's enthusiasm. Foco? Uh, I totally agree. And um, you already sent in a proposal to uh, Kidney X for this, uh, I think it's uh, the round with one and a half million dollars per prize. Um, and I've, I've but I'm biased, of course, in this one. Uh, we send you from the Netherlands the support letter and say, well, this is a very good idea. And it's it's not only a scientifically and medically good idea, but also economically, it's a good idea. It is a way to, to bridge that needling threshold, huh, to, to get the filter into the patient. And it is a safe way to do the first step towards a fully bioartificial artificial kidney. And it already would help the patients. And also, I think the voice of the patient in this whole thing is extremely important. If the organizations like the American Association of Kidney Patients and Home Dialysis United, if they are saying to our the government, this is the way to go, and we are willing to take that risk, and we are willing to, uh, to be on that test panel, that already helps. Uh, Kolf did the first step that was relatively easy. It sounds crazy, but the people were dying anyhow. So he, if they died anyhow, um, and he thought he might be able to help them with the machine, the, the way to connect it was then the decision was easy. Now we have systems that are more or less keeping you alive, but uh, it, it's, it's a burden. And so leaving that relative safety and stepping onto something new, that is difficult, but we're gonna need it. And of course, uh, there's ways to make it as safe as possible, test it, and I'm convinced that Pilonchuvo has done a lot of testing in animals already, and that shows very well, but there is this moment that you have all the, done all the simulations and tests, and then you step into the plane, you make speed, you pull the stick and you and you see whether it flies or not but with nowadays all the computer modeling and all the animal testing that has been done i'm convinced it will fly it'll work 
the only thing we need is give us the money to get it really going and it'll fly. And then it can be 2030. Oh, yes. The, the IHEMO should be a product before 2030. Easily, if there's plenty of funding coming. And once you have the first in human shown, then you get this uh, interesting snowball effect because then suddenly the risk is diminished and people want to invest more. That is what I at least expect. But it's going to be a, a big shockwave for the existing dialysis industry. I, a few days ago, I saw a nice cartoon on LinkedIn. It, it, it was titled First Day at Medical School. A, a guy in a white coat shows on a blackboard, which states, a patient cured is a customer lost. And that is our innovation paradox at the moment. We have to get through that. Absolutely. Um, well, thank you so much, uh, Foco and Shuvo. Uh, I think this is... This is where we'll end it for today, but um, it's been a great session and we wish uh, our whole audience um, happiest of holidays and happy early new year. And uh, we will be back with you uh, in January and uh, this re recording will be on our YouTube page. So you can um, look back on it or share it. And uh, we really appreciate your attention. So thank you everyone. Happy holidays. And thanks for having me.